Alrighty, it is seven o'clock, and therefore we shall not waste any more time. Thank you everyone for being here. Um, if you haven't already joined the GDSC Discord, you'd be welcome to do so. You can scan the QR code or go to this link. Um, it'll be a great place to follow us in the spring, uh, come out to some of our technical events um, throughout the semester. Uh, as I was rightly corrected earlier, this is the third week of review. This week, we're going to be covering AVL trees, heaps, uh, sorting, and bitwise operators. Um, next week, we'll get into some of the more mathy topics. And then first week of January, um, during the first week of school, we'll do a practice exam and leave it open for questions. And that Saturday will be the date of the next foundation exam. So that'll be a great opportunity to uh, ask any burning questions at the very end. As always, uh, Zane's here. Uh, Zane and I will be splitting the topics this week. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get us started with some heaps. Unless How's it anyone, going, everyone? Unless anyone has any um, starting questions. All right. If you have anything, of course, just throw it in the chat. We'll try and monitor as much as possible. Um, you're also welcome to unmute if you need me to stop for anything. All right. Um, so now the question, can I figure out how to use the whiteboard again? All right, here we go. New whiteboard. All right. So first topic today uh, is the topic of heaps. Uh, and a heap is a tree-like data structure in which uh, we have one property that is consistent, either every parent needs to be greater than both of his children, or each parent needs to be less than both of his children. In the first case where the parent is greater, that's called a max heap. Uh, in the second case, uh, that's called a min heap. And as we're drawing out our heap here, we're gonna represent each node in the tree with a circle. We always start with our roots and we need to fill our heap from left to right one level at a time. So I cannot add a node directly to the right. This would be an invalid heap. Instead, what I need to do is I need to add one to the left and now I can add one to the right. And again, I can't start adding to this node because I haven't filled out the previous level yet. So we can add it for here. If this was a min heap, maybe this is the number two and this is the number four. So I'm drawing on a trackpad today. So it's gonna be especially awful. And our parent always needs to be the minimum of the two children. Um, and then our children, again, we start filling from the left. This could be any number. This could be the number eight. Note that the only ordering property here is between parents and children. This eight uh, is you know, technically smaller than 10, but because it's not uh, directly next to it, it doesn't, you know, there's no problem there. This is still a valid heap. And we can go ahead and keep adding things on here as much as we want. So uh, let's talk about some heap operations here. Um, our bread and butter operation is that we need to be able to add to our heap. Um, adding to our heap is pretty easy to do. We always just add to the bottom row and the furthest left that we can. If we run out of space, then we need to move on to the next row and that would be down here by the eight. And let's say this time we didn't add a number um, that's just smaller. And I wanna actually change this to be something unique. Let's say in this case, we added the number one. So we're always going to add to the bottom of our heap, but this one uh, breaks the property where the parent has to be smaller than uh, both of its children. So this is no longer a valid min heap. And so we need to percolate this node up the, up the heap until it gets to the right position. So uh, in this case, since we added this node, we'll check against its parents. These are in the wrong order. And so we can go ahead and erase. Oh, we can go ahead and erase. And then we'll replace and put our 10 down here and our one stays up there. And now we need to check it against the parent again. So these are in the wrong order yet again, which means we'll go ahead and erase these. And 
And so our one goes up to the top and our two stays down. Okay, so now we are back to a valid heap. We have correctly inserted our node. It's in the right position. Um, and now we can go on our merry way. Let's say we wanted to add something else here. Um, maybe we're gonna add, I don't know, a zero. Then in that case, we would go ahead and swap these two. And then we go ahead and swap these two again. All right, let's undo that really quick. Let's say that we want to delete a uh, element from our heap. Most commonly, this operation is gonna be deleting from the top, but it doesn't have to be from the top. Like we could delete this four, or we could delete this 11. In the case um, where we were deleting the, the node at the very bottom right, you know, there's no other operations we need to do. It's still a valid heap. So we're not even really gonna consider that here. But most commonly we want to delete from the from the roots. And the reason for this is because a heap is our best implementation of a priority queue. So if I um, if we go back to week number one where we have queues, uh, our queue is first in, first out. Um, so in that case, we want to be able to take the element on the front of the queue out and add to the end. Um, but a priority queue sort of changes this a little bit. We still need to be able to take away from the front, um, but our queue needs to be sorted in some particular order. So let's say we wanted to have a queue where the smallest numbers came first. And every time we pop off the queue, we want to get the next smallest number. Well, we can do that with our heap um, because our heap always has the smallest number at the top if it's a min heap. So this is a really good implementation of that. And we'll look at some of the runtime analysis for these operations uh, at the very end to show you why. But most commonly, we'll be taking from the root if we had this as a priority queue. That's why we would do that. So if we need, wanted to do that, we want to go ahead and erase this one. What we would need to do is we need to keep this a valid heap. And right now, this is not, there needs to be something up here. And what we're going to do is we're going to take uh, the node that appears at the very bottom, and we're just going to take it off. So if we take away this node, it's still a valid heap because we're filling from the bottom here. And we're going to put that up where the node we deleted was. So this 10 goes up and fills in place for the one. And now this is no longer a valid heap because this ordering is messed up. It's a valid heap in terms of filling in the correct uh, shape here, but we do need to go ahead and adjust this so that our ordering is correct. So what we can do here, because this is a min heap, the smaller number of the two children needs to replace this 10. So we're gonna take the two, which is the smaller number, and we're gonna swap that for the 10 up here. Note if we had swapped the four, that it would be four, two, and 10, and we would still have messed up ordering because the two would be below the four. So uh, anytime that we delete an element, we wanna take our most recently added element, put it up where the element we deleted is, and then go ahead and trickle it down um, as much as we need to. Um, we got a question here maybe. When we delete the root, the root node, we were to replace it with the last added value. Absolutely. Um, and this would go for any node that we want to delete. If we were deleted this eight over here, we would need to replace it with the most recently added node as well. Anything we delete needs to be replaced. And then we will go ahead and trickle it down or up uh, as much as we need. OK, so the reason why we want to use um, a priority queue uh, as a as a min heap or a max heap um, is if we wanted to add a node here, our average case runtime is going to be um, log of n. And the reason why is because our heap is a binary tree in this implementation, which means um, the length of any of our paths in the tree is log of n. And when we add something, we go ahead and stick it on the end and then we percolate it up to the very top of the tree. So the maximum number of operations we have to run is log of n, that height of the tree. So that's going to be our average in our worst case. In the best case, we go ahead and stick it on here, and then it doesn't have to go anywhere, and it's just constant time. Uh, 
If we wanted to delete a node, again, we take it out, we replace the thing at the bottom. So that's constant time. That's always going to be the same amount of operations. And then again, we have to trickle it down, which is log of n. So our addition and our deletion are both uh, log of n complexity which is really, really nice compared to if we had a priority queue that was like an array or a linked list where we'd have to do linear time searches in order to figure out where we want to insert something in that ordered list. Cool. Um, so these are the, yeah, we could do that. Um, so insert, we're going to leave it as an I. Our worst case is going to be, oh, this is so bad. I'm so sorry. I wonder if I can type this. This would probably be easier. Worst case log of n, best case o of 1. And this is for insertion. Now we just got to make this bigger. Let's make this 28. No. All right, so this is our insertion runtime here. Our average case um, is, I don't know exactly how to define this here, but I think uh, average case is also gonna be O of log of N. Um, because we're going to have to, you know, trickle it up some amount. It might be like halfway up the tree. It might be the whole way up the tree, um, but it wouldn't be constant time because it's going to, on average, percolate at least some of the way. So I think log of n here is safe. Our deletion, um, our deletion is a little bit different here. So in the worst case, Again, we would go ahead and delete from the roots. We would take a node from the bottom and put it up, and then it would trickle all the way down to fill in the bottom. And so our worst case is going to be log of n. Um, and uh, this is assuming that we have a very large tree. Like this tree is not very large. Um, if we had a tree that was really small and just one node, then all of these are constant time. But th that doesn't really count. We have to assume that we have a really big tree and that n is really big. Um, not that we have like an empty tree or something like that. So in the best case here, our best case would be that we take a node from the bottom here and we take it up to uh, the top. Actually, this is not the best case. The best case would be that we take a node from our bottom row here Let's say we had another node here that was like 13. And let's say we deleted the eight and then we replaced our 13 over here instead. And we take this out. Well, now it doesn't have to trickle anywhere. It's already at the right position and our tree already exists all the same. And this works at a very large tree as well if we take from the bottom and put it onto the bottom. So our best case here, I think also uh, is constant time. And then on average, it's going to have to trickle some amount down. So we can say this is log of n as well. Um, I would definitely review your, your um, best case and worst case uh, before you take the exam. Pretty much all of your heap questions are going to be like drawing out a heap uh, and asking you to perform operations on it or asking for runtime of operations. So it will appear a lot. <clears throat> Being able to like reason them out is definitely better than just memorizing them, but you gotta do what you gotta do. So if you're one of the people that needs to memorize, by all means. Okay, uh, the other two things that I don't wanna spend too much time on because I wanna make sure we have time for everything else today um, is heapify and heap sorts. Um, I just wanna cover them briefly and kind of talk about what they are. Um, one other thing to mention here, Searching on a heap does not really make a whole lot of sense because there is no like real ordering other than this is going to be smaller than these two. If we wanted to look for the node, um, like let's say this was gone, we had another node here, and this was 20. 
if we wanted to search for 20, well, we have no idea how to traverse from a route to get there. So we would basically just have to do a BFS or a DFS. Like we would have to go through the whole tree, check all the nodes for our 20. So searching in a heap does not really make a whole lot of sense. If you can avoid it, great. If you don't need to search, if you want to just handle, um, in the case of priority queue, just the front and the back, then that's perfectly easy to do. Um, but if you have something that requires searching, you may need a different data structure. OK, so we're going to keep that. Um, and then let's talk really quickly about heap sort and heapify. So a heapify is if I have an array of elements that I want to insert. Uh, and let's just put them in the order that I want to insert them um, in this representation. So let's say I want to put an eight in here, and then a seven, and then a one, and then a three, and then a nine. Uh, and we'll leave it there. And if I wanted to make a max heap this time, just to mix it up a little bit, um, our heapify is the build heap operation. So we want to build our heap um, one node at a time. And so we can go ahead and start with our eight. That's our root. Our seven needs to go down here. Um, and every time we add a new node, we need to check if we need to percolate it up. So our seven does not need to swap because we're saying this one is a max heap. Um, and then we add our one directly to the right of it. And this one also doesn't need to change. And then we can add our three down here. This was a very bad example. Let's change this to 13. So our 13 is down here. And now we need to go ahead and push it up as much as possible. So we'll go ahead and replace our seven and our 13. And it's also going to swap with eight. So I'm going to do it all in one go here. Yeah. And then we have our nine, which needs to go right here. And again, we need to push it up as much as possible. So we swap our nine and our eight. Great. And so now we have our heap constructed from all of these different elements. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is our build heap operation. It's basically just a bunch of uh, insertions over and over again. And we also need to be careful about the runtime here. I was reading something as I was reviewing today that said that our build heap operation, uh, you can prove it that it runs in O of n time rather than log of n. Um, which seems counterintuitive because you would think, well, I insert it on the bottom and then at worst I need to push it up however many times. There was a really complicated summation proof that I'm not really gonna look at um, from Stack Overflow. I would advise you all to review this um, just to make sure that you, you sort of have a, a basis and then just go ahead and memorize it because the proof was really, really disgusting. And then as Zane has put in the chat, um, heap sort is another thing we can do here. Essentially what we wanna do is if we have an array of unsorted elements here, we can put it all into a heap and then take out the top element at a time and update our heap um, after every single iteration so that it's still a valid heap. And then we take out the next highest element and then the next highest element and so on and so forth. And at the end, this is our biggest element because the heap uh, was originally sorted as such. And then 13 would go in the first element of our sorted array. And then we'd go ahead and re, you know, fix our heap. Nine would be at the top and then we take nine as the second element and so on and so forth. Um, so this is a different, you know, one of many sorting algorithms they might cover and I have no idea a little bit later, um, but that's another thing that you could definitely review before you take the exam. All right. Uh, so with that all being said, I'm going to go ahead and jump into um, our review site, and we'll go ahead and do one or two heap questions, um, just so we can get the pass, uh, get the practice. All 
All right, so we're going to go ahead and go up to topics here, and we'll select heaps, and we'll begin. All right, so this one is pretty, uh, pretty quick and easy. All we're trying to do here is perform delete min. Uh, because this is a min heap, our minimum element is always at the top. So it wants us to delete the top element. Um, and then we need to show what the resulting heap would be. Uh, for questions like this, usually you'll get partial credit if some of the heap is correct or if certain properties are intact. But if you give them a tree that is not a valid heap, you will probably just get zero points. Um, even if you don't perform the operation 100% correctly, if you at least give a valid heap, you'll probably get partial credit. All right, so our starting heap is what they give us and we're deleting the 14. So let's go ahead and construct this in our text editor. 22, 72. And then this is 38. 40, 80, and 90. Great. And so we want to take out our 14. And after doing this, in order to keep our heap correct, we have to replace it. And we do it with the most recently inserted element, which is our 90. And our 90 goes away. So this is still a valid heap. But our ordering property has been um, destructed. And so now we need to go ahead and trickle our 90 down by selecting the smallest element to go up. 22 is smaller than 27, so we're going to replace it down here. And then again, 38 and 40 are smaller than 90, so we need to pick the smaller element, which is 38, and replace it over here. All right, and so this is our resulting heap. If we go ahead and check our solution. 22, 72, 80, 38, 40, 90. All right, so we got the tree correct. Again, you get partial credit if parts of the resulting tree are correct, but not all of it. Um, in this case, it's not a zero out of six if you don't give a valid heap, um, but there are some questions like that. So this is pretty easy, five points. Everyone should get this. Um, this is definitely one of the easier ones. Um, so this is another case where we want to uh, show the results and perform an operation. We'll go ahead and do this one too, because it covers another important thing that I forgot to talk about. So this first question, it's going to give us a tree, and we need to check if it's a valid min heap. And if so, give an array representation of this min heap. Yes, if it's a max min heap, we always grab from the rightmost element on the bottom row. And the reason is because if we grab anything else, well, then our complete order, our you know completion property, where every row above the bottom level has to be filled, and then the bottom level has to be filled from left to right. If we grabbed any other node in the tree other than the bottom rightmost node, it's no longer uh, filling that, uh, that property. So that's why we always grab from the bottom row. Okay, so our array representation of a min heap, if we had an array here where each index represents some elements, um, and this goes for basically any tree, we can represent it this way. What we wanna do is we wanna put our first element as a three, um, whatever our root is, and then we go ahead and put in our 93 and our 44. So we're going top, left, right, and then we go, um, in every row left to right. So this would be 207, and this would be 99. And if we had elements over here, they would go afterwards. So anytime we want to put this as an array, um, we start at the roots, we go full, fully across left to right, um, which works with the representation of a heap where it has to be filled left to right. Um, so we'll never have any gaps in our array. So is this a valid min heap? Three is less than these two, which is great. 93 is less than these two, which is great. These all have no children, so no worries there. This is a valid min heap. This would be our array representation. Um, if you needed to operate on this array, um, like you could perform 
insertions, deletions, heapify, heap sort by representing this tree as an array. Uh, it would be a little bit more complicated to try and reason out, but you can always link up. Um, there's a there's a formula for it, which parent corresponds to which two children in the array. Um, you could you could definitely look it up, but three corresponds to these two, and then this next element corresponds to these two. This next element would correspond to the next two. Okay, so we have our array, um, and then we need to insert three into the min heap um, and outline each step in the process. 48. This is 48. 68. 78. 99. Okay, so if we needed to insert this, uh, let me go ahead and knock all of these out. So if we need to insert a new thing, then it's gonna go on the bottom most row as far to the right as possible, which is down here. And then we're inserting, so we need to percolate it up the min heap. Three replaces the 48 because three is smaller. And then three replaces 28 because it's smaller. And this is our new min heap. And we can go ahead and check this. Yes, it is a valid min heap. This is our array representation. Um, one thing, um, apologies, one thing that gets mentioned every once in a while is um, that typically when you're representing as an array, you'd start from uh, index one. Um, if, you're, if you're doing this from a mathematical formula, including zero kind of breaks the formula. And so I think it's standard conventions to start from a one, but it absolutely does not matter. Um, both the array representations are fine. And then all these different steps, our final tree matches up with what they have here, which is great. Honestly, uh, most of these heap tracing questions should be very, very straightforward. I went through a bunch of these problems. I didn't really see anything on heapify and heap sort, um, but uh, that's that's a lie. There is, you know, building building a heap of all new elements that does appear on the exam, so you should definitely be able to do that. All right, let's review chat here. See if there's anything. Level order, parent to child. Yeah, go ahead, Kenny. All right, I'm just realizing, oh, there we go. Three is on the left side inside under two. Mm -hmm. So the reason for this is that when we insert our three, it has to go on the bottom row and furthest to the right. This bottom row is currently filled, and so we need to start a new row. And so three, it's inserted down here, and then it percolates up. Yeah, so bottom right if you can. If you need to start a new row, then you certainly can. All right, uh, let's check here if this is worth doing. All right, we'll just talk about this first one up here um, and then I'll pass it off to Zane. So uh, this question says, Maria has 125 prime numbers in a max heap. How tall will the max heap be? So again, the height of our heap is uh, log of n, where we have binary heap, so it's log base two of whatever our thing here is. So this is log base two of 125 elements. And this comes out to, I believe, six. Um, I th you could do this with a calculator. I don't know if you get a calculator on the test. Um, but we can we can prove this if we have 125 elements. Remembering that you have to fill the row above before you can start filling the row below. Our first row is going to be one element, and we're going to keep a total of what we have here. We have one element. Our second row can be two elements, um, and we're multiplying by two every time because everything can have two children. So now we have three. 
Our next row is going to be four elements. Now we have seven, then eight elements, and this is 15, then 16 elements. We now have 31 in our heap, and then 32 elements. Uh, we have 63 in our heap. And then the next row can hold 64, um, but in order to get to 125, we only need to add an extra um, 62. So this does not get 100% filled. Um, oop, I stand corrected. I think we have seven, uh, seven layers. All right, and then this down here is just more um, trace, tracing things out, which you guys can definitely do. Height of six, two. I get. I guess they're quantifying height as how many levels we have, other than our root. Hmm. This looks like seven levels to me. All right, I guess they're not counting the root here. Uh, definitely going through some of these problems would be a good idea. All right, 7.30, uh, I'm gonna jump on to the next topic. So I'm gonna pass it over to Sane. Okay, give me one second. Okay, so we're gonna hop into sorting. Hold on a second. Okay, there we go. All right, so there's multiple algorithms that you guys are gonna have to go through. Or you're gonna have to learn. So first things first, there's insertion, or actually bubble sort. Let's do bubble sort first. So let's say we had an array of just a few values. Let's say four, three, five, one. Okay, so if we have this type of just a small array, then really what's going to happen is we're going to have an n squared algorithm. And the way that this algorithm specifically is going to work is we're going to, for every single indices, we're going to try to find where can we push a value backwards from the current point that we're at. So for example, if we want to satisfy or find something to place into this point, we can start from this indices. There's really multiple ways to go about it. You can kind of swap them from left to right or right to left. Um, I'm actually going to uh, do it in this order, but you can also do it in this order. Uh, the only type of question I believe that does it from right to left is insertion. But for bubble sort, we're going to take every single element and say, okay, is this one greater than the one to its right? If so, then let's swap. So what that's going to look like is this is going to become a three and this is going to become a Let's just swap right here. So this becomes a three and this becomes a four. So now we're at another index. So let's just have a blue pointer here. And now we're gonna do the same check from this point onwards. So now we're gonna check, okay, is four greater than five? No, it's not. Then we're gonna move it forward. And we're gonna check again. Okay, is five greater than the thing after it? So is, is it greater than one? So it is. So now we're gonna make that swap. And now at this point, since we have nothing else to compare compare this blue pointer with at this point right here, then we're just going to stop. And really what you're going to notice with bubble sort is that if you do it this way, everything to the right is going to be kind of a, a sorted part of the array. So now we know that from this point on to the right, everything is sorted. And of course, just if it's one value, then it's always sorted. But you know, we're going to start to see, uh, we're going to end up having, you know, two values that are sorted, three, and then ultimately four. So now at this point, we can move the yellow pointer down to where four is, start our blue pointer here, and we're going to do the same operation again. So I'm just going to go a little quicker. So one and four, we can move the blue one down here. And we can see, okay, four is in its place. It comes before five. So now at this point, uh, we're good. We don't have to keep, we'll, we can keep going here. We're gonna stop and that's it. 
Uh, but really, we're going to end up doing this operation again. We're always going to start from here. I actually messed up and started from here. Uh, we would start always from the very beginning. And then at this point is when we would make a swap. And we would say, okay, three and one. Let's swap those. One and three. And uh, we can, you will do one more iteration, but at this point, we know that we're fully sorted. Whenever you don't make any swaps, you can completely stop. So if we were to go through this again and see, okay, we got to the very end, but nothing was swapped or kind of moved around, then we know we're fully sorted. So this that's bubble sort. Now there's another algorithm where this is uh, insertion. So here we just did bubble, let's do insert. Insertion is probably the most intuitive for most people since it's, it's really easy to kind of follow. So let's just do a similar example. Just do five, four, one, three. Okay, so we can, let's say start at this point and we can start from the very end, we can kind of have like one pointer uh, at this location, and then we can have another pointer throughout the, the rest of the array. So we can kind of track, okay, where do we want to place uh, this value? Is it at the best location up until now? Meaning is it less than, or is it, yeah, is it less than anything that comes before it? So right here, we know that nothing comes before it. So we're not going to do anything. When we're at this location, we're going to say, okay, is four greater or is it lesser than what comes before it? So in this case, if we're trying to sort it in ascending order, we know that four must come before five. So we're going to end up making the swap. So we're going to have four and we're going to have five. And uh, then we're just going to keep on going. So now we're going to be here. We're going to say, okay, is one greater than, or sorry, is one less than five? Yes, it is. So now we're going to make that swap. And really, instead of just doing all these swaps, you can kind of just look at it when it comes to insertion. So you can kind of say, okay, where should this one go? Like, where is the last location in the array where uh, every value is greater than or equal to one? So really, we know that the best place for one is right here because all these numbers are greater than it. So we just kind of have, we can just kind of visually look at that and say, okay, we would have made two swaps, so swap one, swap two, and that would have kind of shuffled over one to this location, four to this location, and five to this one. And now for three, we're gonna do the same exact thing. So we're gonna look backwards. Okay, three is greater, or three is less than five then we also know that uh, if we put three here, three is gonna be less than four, but we know that three would not be lesser than one. So we're just gonna end up stopping at this point after we place three right here. So at this point, our final array would be one, three, four, five. So that is insertion. And the same thing, the case is also n squared. So average, worse, everything, Oh yeah, and, and also best should be. Uh, when it comes to bubble sort, when, when it comes to bubble sort, it's always gonna be O of N squared if you don't have the optimization where you check, okay, how many swaps have I made? When it comes to insertion, there's only one case where your best case is O of N and that's also when it's sorted. So uh, how does that end up happening? It's just because let's say we have an array one, three, four. We're going to be at this point. We know that we can't swap or look backwards. So we know it's in the best place. We know that three, when we check backwards, we're going to see, okay, is this lesser than this value right here to its left? It's not. Okay. So just keep going. So this if check is just O of one. And since we're never iterating backwards, then it's not really N squared. And then same thing here, we're gonna say, okay, should this go anywhere behind where we currently are? Is it less than three? It's not, okay, so now we're not gonna move it and now we're done. So this was O of N. So this is the best case for insert. So this is just best case. This is worst case and average case. And for bubble, 
average worst. And technically, they always put that this is also the best, but there's a tweak you can make to make it uh, all of n if it is sorted. Just count the number of swaps. But generally, they just say it's all n squared. OK, then we have a selection sort. So selection sort, it'll look similar to insert, but it's really not. So in insert, you're actually swapping elements backwards, backwards until it's the best location where it can be like, okay, everything behind me is less than or equal to the current value I'm at. But when it comes to selection sort, you're just trying to find the best or the smallest value from where you currently are. So let's say we have uh, 99, 10, 1, and 3. So we're going to start off at this location. And what we're going to do, if we do it like this, is we're going to check the rest of the array. So we're going to check from this point onwards, wherever we have underlined in blue. And we're going to find the index of the smallest value. So we know the indexes are 0, 1, 2, 3. And we're going to end up swapping these two locations, because we know that this is the best index that we have. And by the way, the index is going to start off at 0 just because this might be the best value. So in the case that this was, for example, uh, negative one, we would want to have this value here. We wouldn't want to take anything from here because this could be the best one already. Uh, but we just don't know that ahead of time. So yeah, you're going to start off with this value. And whenever you find something smaller, so here you're going to say, OK, the best index is 10. It's going to start off at 0. Next best index is 10. Next, next best index is 1 or sorry, two, um, and then we're going to swap these in right here. So now this right here is going to become a one, and this becomes a 99. And now from here, we're going to move this. Now we're going to be at this location. Find the best value, but now it's going to be in this range right here. So best index is one, then we're going to find three. We're going to swap that in. And we have 10 here. And then now we're going to be at this location where we're going to check the rest of the array, which is just this right here. And that's where we're going to make our swap. And then our array is fully sorted. So here we have uh, 10 and then 99. OK, so those are the three n squared. Uh, for selection, it's also going to be n squared on all the cases. The only one with the special case generally is insertion, which on the foundation, they'll try to get you with that. So insertion's best case, just put O of N. Now we can move on to a few other ones. Quick sort is probably the most complicated one. And I'm not going to go over that one. I might just go over the partition, but let's just cover merge sort quickly since uh, it's not as bad of an algorithm. And then we'll hop into two or three of the questions. So, okay, so this is good enough. Okay, so let's do some values. Okay, so the way that merge sort works is you kind of try to divide the array into uh, subgroups where then you can kind of end up saying, okay, this goes on the left side because it's smaller. This goes on the right side because it's bigger. And really the base cases that merge stores kind of build upon is there, there's really two of them. So there's one base case where uh, this doesn't normally happen, but it could happen where you actually have nothing in, in the range of indexes because we know that typically you start from low to high. So we go from zero to seven. Let's say there's nothing in that range of indexes. So let's say for some reason, these values overlap. If you have a good base case condition, this is not going to happen. So let's say, for example, similar to when binary search kind of crosses over, uh, like left and, and the, the left and right or the low and high crossover, for example, if this is zero and this is negative one, we know that there's no values in between this range because your low or your left should be 
lesser than your high or you know equal now in the case of merge sort if just think about it like this if i give you a box right with a number of elements but let's say i give you a box with zero elements is the box sorted the box is sorted now let's say i give you a box but with just one element so let's just say this is a number five is this sorted right now? Yes, it is. So th that's kind of another uh, thing that you kind of have to be aware of when it comes to merge sort. It's built on the on the base case of, okay, if something is empty, if a range is empty, it's sorted. If a range only has one value, it's also sorted. And that is why typically your base case when it comes to merge sort is, uh, or actually, yeah, your, your base case are really the condition that you want to keep on going on. So if low is, is less than high, then this is where you're gonna wanna do your recursive calls. But if it's equal or they've crossed over and for whatever reason, then you don't wanna do anything because it's already sorted. So that's just a quick preface into uh, why, why that is. And it makes sense once you kind of trace it out. So like I had mentioned, you're gonna start off with a left and a right, and then you're gonna kind of divide the array into a left and right side through the recursive call. So what that would look like is, okay, we're gonna take our low and our high, and we're gonna to wanna to find a midpoint. So we can take zero plus seven divided by two and see that just gives you three. And now we know that the left side is gonna go from zero to three. And then the right side is gonna go from four to seven. Okay, so this is these are the two sides that we're going to be working with now. So what that's going to look like is we're going to have 3, 1, 10, and 6. And similarly on this side, we're going to have 4, 0, 9, 8. Now we're going to do the same thing on, on each of these sides. Um, we are actually going to go down this path first. I accidentally drew this one as well right now, but... Okay, so I'm going to end up going, so this is zero and three, right? So now we're going to do the same exact thing, zero plus three divided by two. This is going to give us one. So now we know that our left half is going to be from zero to one inclusive. So that's going to look like three and one. So zero and one. And then on this side, it's going to be the other half of that from two to three. And uh, yeah, you guys will notice that I did like a perfect power of two. So I did eight, just so you guys can see like, uh, you know, like, I guess the perfect case. So now we're going to have 10, six. So let's do two, three. Oh yeah. I also drew this one out again. I shouldn't have done that yet. We're recursing. So now this is the base case that I had mentioned. So this is going to be where the index is just on its own. So we're, we're looking from zero to zero, because when we end up splitting this up, we're going to go to the left, which is just zero. And an array of one is already sorted. In this case, we're going to go down here. We're going to see, okay, it's just a value of one, at index one. That's already sorted. So now this is where we start merging. We're going to take everything on the left half and on the right half and just kind of see, okay, should this go first or should this go first? Should this value on the left go first or this value on the right? And we're going to go in that fashion. So we know that it ends up going one and three. So that's good. Then at this point, we've sorted the left and right half. Okay, so we end up sorting the left and right half. So now we have one and three. And now we can do uh, the same thing with this side. So we're gonna end up hitting the base case of 10. There's a single value and we can choose, okay, which one goes first? We know six goes first from each half. We have these two halves. And now what we're gonna do at this stage is this array is actually going to look like this uh, if we really think about it. So uh, it's actually gonna be one, three, six, and then 10. So you have one, three, six, and 10. In this case, it's actually already sorted, but what would happen is we would take these two halves and say, okay, which value goes first? Okay, one goes first, place that in an array. Then uh, which goes first, three or six? Three goes first, okay, place that. Then we say, okay, this side is already completely done. 
So just play six and 10. And we're going to keep going in that order. So now I'm just going to kind of speed through this so you guys can kind of see what ends up happening. We're going to have four, zero. We're going to swap each side. So this goes to four, this goes to, this goes to zero, this goes to four. And it's going to end up becoming nine, eight. And these two sides are sorted. So now we have zero, four, eight, and nine. And this is where we're going to kind of merge both these sides. So which goes first? We know zero is going to go first. Then four is going to go first. Now we're going to place eight and nine since this side, this half is already completed. We've already gone through all the elements. And this is where we can finally end up sorting all the values. So now ultimately we have these two halves. So we have these two halves right here. And we can sort them accordingly. So now we can take the same approach. Okay, which comes first, zero or one? So zero, okay. Now let's just move that over. Which comes first, one or four? It's one and so on. So, so this is the merging process. So three comes first, four goes next, then we have six. So let's just move those forward. Then eight comes first, then we have nine, right? So we're gonna place nine. So let's just place nine. And now we know that the right half is completely done. So we've gone through all those values. So we just kind of have to empty out the left half and that's gonna leave us with 10. And that goes zero, one, three, four, six, eight, nine, ten. 10. So that's really the full thing when it comes to merge sort. Um, I'm just trying to kind of going through these and this is really all you kind of need to go through the questions on the FE, just understand how it works and how to trace it out. I'm gonna go through two questions real quick. Uh, we, I will say that quick sort doesn't come up too much. And uh, the algorithm is relatively simple to partition. They're never gonna ask you to trace out the full quick sort because it just, it just gets very hectic and complicated. But essentially what happens is, let's just uh, pick a couple values. You're gonna pick one value. Oh, actually, let's do it like this. Let's pick a different value. So you're going to pick one value and you're going to place that in one side of the array. So let's say we end up picking a six. So we end up picking six and we just leave six at the very left of the array, right? So now we're going to have two pointers. So we're going to have a low and a high or a left and a right. And now we're just going to kind of see, okay, ideally, so we're trying to pick a pivot value. So what happens is with partition, you kind of want to have everything to the that's smaller than a value to the left, anything that's less than or equal to, to the left of that number and everything that is greater than to the right. So in this case, we know that what it's gonna look like, it's either gonna be one, two, six, seven, since this is the middle value that we're kind of pivoting things around, or it's gonna be two, one, six, seven. Cause in both of these cases, we know that everything to our left is less than or equal to six and everything to our right is greater than six. This doesn't mean that it has to be sorted in order. However, um, it, it's just that it follows a property. Okay, everything to my left is less than or equal to where I'm at right now. So that's kind of the idea with, with, with quick sort. And you're gonna kind of do this over all these uh, ranges in the array and it just ends up sorting. But yeah, it's just tracing out the full thing would be too much for an exam. So, like I had mentioned, we're gonna to wanna to see how many things go to the left of where this is meant to, to be at. So, okay, so we're kind of pivoting around six. So is two less than or equal to, uh, is two less than or equal to six? Yes, it is. So now we're gonna move this forward. And what's gonna happen here is we're gonna see, okay, six is not, so six is not, less than, uh, what do you call it, seven. So now we're just gonna stop, or, or sorry, seven is not less than or equal to six. So 
while things are less than or equal to the value that we're looking at, so while things are less than or equal to two, we're going to keep moving forward. And once we hit something that should be on the opposite side of six, so if we're moving for everything that's smaller or equal to, whenever we hit something that's greater, we stop. Now we're going to start moving the right pointer towards the center. So now we're going to see, okay, uh, does this belong on the right side of six? So is one greater than six? No, it's not. So now we're going to end up uh, actually leaving this here because it doesn't follow the property. It doesn't belong on the right side. So whenever we find a case where, okay, these things belong on opposite ends, that's when we're going to actually end up swapping. So now we're going to end up swapping. Low is less than the right. So now we're going to swap uh, one and seven. So that's kind of where we're at right now. Now we're going to keep running the algorithm. We're going to see one comes before six. Right, so now what we're gonna do is move this forward, and um, we're gonna see that the seven come before six. No, it doesn't. So now we're gonna see. Okay, we're, uh, we have our right pointer. Does this come after six? Yes, it does. So now let's keep moving this towards the center. And here, when it crosses over, that's when you want to stop because now you know for sure you've kind of partition everything everything on the left goes on the left side we've already done that we've made sure of that and everything that's on the right is on the right side that's why you do those swaps in the case that something belongs on the opposite side that's where you swap things and at the very end you're going to take this index so index zero and this is index one two three and just swap this with your right pointer so in this case we're going to swap one and we're going to swap uh, six. So now it's become six. And if you notice, now we have one, two, six, seven. And everything on the left is less than or equal to six. And everything on the right is greater than six. So that, I'm sorry if that was kind of confusing. Uh, but yeah, you just kind of end up moving things while they belong on one side. And whenever it doesn't, you stop. Same thing on the opposite side and just swap them over. So that's really the whole idea with uh, quick sort or with, with uh, partition on quick sort. So let's just hop into two questions real quick, and then we can move on to the next topic. Okay, so let's just uh, start off on this question. And let's see, okay, so the code below is a buggy implementation of selection sort. So int array, and so they're just passing an array and giving you a size. And we're iterating from, uh, yeah, we're iterating from right to left on the outer loop. And then we're iterating from left to right on the inner loop. And we're trying to see when is there an issue? Okay. So what I had mentioned with selection sort is you're starting off at an index, right? So, What's happening here is it's always starting at the first index of the array. But the thing is, at any given point, you're looking at one single index. And in this case, they're going from right to left. So really, the way that they're doing it is, let's say we have and these values. So let's say we have, they're starting at this index. And then they're kind of scanning from left to right. Like, okay. Is this smaller than what's at this index? Is this smaller than what's at this index or the, the smallest index? Is this smaller? Okay. If this is the smallest one, then we're going to swap over. But what they're doing here is they're just taking whatever value is right here, so five, and setting that as the best. Uh, so they're just kind of moving things over, just kind of se selecting the best value at any, any given point, at any given point. And then they're just going to end up stopping. But really what's going to end up happening is that uh, you're not going to actually end up making a swap. You're just kind of reassigning a value. So you're going to want to make this the actual index that you're currently at. And you're not always going to want to use index zero. Your, your index is always going to be changing because let's say index zero is not actually like the best, the best value that you can put into the next location. 
you're going to want to start off whatever index you're currently at because the idea of selection sort is one side of your array becomes sorted and then the other side of the array is potentially unsorted so by assuming okay index zero let's start off there that's going to actually end up giving you issues and especially since you're not performing any swaps so um, yeah it was just really this right here you're going to want to start off at index i and then here you're going to want to assign it to j in index j and then also um, you're going to want to use best as the index into your array so you're kind of comparing because really the index of best can change so for example if i pick best as five as uh, this is index one, so let's say uh, best equals index zero. So we're gonna say, okay, best is right here, but really we know that the best value is actually at index two. So we're gonna wanna kind of use array of best to kind of tell us, okay, at this index that we have as best, what is there? But we're gonna wanna change that as well. So there's really a couple of things that you can kind of change. But they're asking what should it store? It should be the index. And this is part of the reason why. So now they're asking if we fix the code so that best stores what it ought to, we would have to change the if statement. Yeah, so that's what I mentioned. Once we make the changes, we can fix sort by replacing the line of code with three lines of code. So show the three line fix. So the three line fix, Remember that at the end of selection sort, once you found the best possible index where like the best possible value is like either the smallest or the greatest value, depending on how you're doing it, you're going to want to swap that in. So really what the swap code looks like is just like they ended up mentioning. So you have a temp variable and you can just set that array of uh, the current index that you're at. So you got array of i. Then you can end up saying array of i equals array of best so this is the best index that you the best value that you found so far at this index and then we set array of best equal to 10 so this actually ends up making the full swap now uh this will end up fixing the code aside from you know the if statement what this holds and everything so let's just check that yeah so storing up until the index is just sort of index and uh, yeah, so we just end up making the swap and that's pretty much it. Okay, so now let's go on to the next question. Fun, okay, so this is insertion sort. Okay, so like I had mentioned, this one isn't as bad. This one's probably one of the easier ones. So I'm just gonna go ahead and do this one right here. Let's just end up going through it so you guys can kind of see um, the thought process behind it. So I think these are all the numbers. 26, 9, Yeah. Okay, so they kind of give you a hint by giving you the next iteration, so really the first iteration. So they just kind of show you how they're doing that. And like I had mentioned, sometimes people get confused between, okay, are they doing it from the left or are they doing it from the right? And it should be kind of easy to tell which direction that they're doing it in. But let's just, like I said, end up going through it. Uh, they're doing insertion. So okay, so this is iteration zero, one, two, three. Okay. Okay, so let's end up going through. So we noticed that six ended up getting placed backwards. So we're gonna have to do the same thing uh, for this next index. So we know that 13, there's nothing before it that we can kind of compare against. So it just kind of stays there. We don't really consider that, which is why we end up starting at index one for the first iteration. And now we're just gonna look backwards, okay. Uh, does this does this uh, go before 13? It does, so they make the swap. So now at in iteration two, we're actually at index two. So now what we're gonna do is compare, okay, 
does nine end up going before 13? Yeah, it does. So now we're going to end up having this list. So now we're going to end up making that swap. And this is our iteration two. Let's just have iteration seven here. Okay. So this is our iteration two. And now let's see. So we just ended up making a swap at uh, index two. So we were right here. And now we end up swapping this. So now we're actually at 27. So we're at index uh, where 27 is at. And now we're going to see, okay, does 27 go before 13? No, it doesn't. So we just don't do anything in this iteration. Now we're going to go on to iteration four, where we're going to be at three. And we can just kind of think, okay, where does three end up going? This one's pretty easy. It goes before 27, before 13, before nine, before 16. So we can just kind of shuffle these to the right and put three in the place of six. So that's going to end up uh, looking like this. Okay, so three, six, and then what do we got? So now we're at 15 for iteration uh, five. And we're just gonna see again, where does this go? Does this come before 27? It does. So now we're just gonna end up making the swap. So this becomes 15 and this becomes 27. And now we're done. Now for iteration six, we're at index one. And this is where we're just gonna see, okay, where, where does this end up going? Like this ends up going all the way to the front, right? So I just end up moving this all the way over. And then for iteration seven, they end up doing it for you. So for iteration seven, we've been looking at this value. So 12, and we know that 12 ends up going right here between nine and 13. So that's pretty much it. So that's insertion. It's a pretty easy question. So just five points, you should be able to get that one. Let's just end up checking that. So yeah, so iteration, let's say iteration four. So 13, 27, yeah. So that's pretty much it. This is really not that hard for these type of questions. You just have to know how the algorithm works and that's it. Uh, you don't have to necessarily know code. I know we just did a code question, but those are really infrequent. And I think that's, those are older. Actually, no, it's, it's not as old. It's, it's just like last year, but they don't normally come up is what I'm trying to say. So. I wouldn't be too worried about actually seeing code, just actually know how it works. Okay, so I'm gonna pass it over to Eli for the next topic. Hey, Eli, are you there? Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, probably. You probably went to the bathroom. All right then, so. I guess let, let me just end up going to the next topic. So I was going to do bitwise. So let's just do bitwise in the meantime. And then he can finish up. Yeah, this is this is the fun stuff. I, I know you guys, you guys love bitwise. Okay, so when we go to bitwise, there's really only a couple operations you got to know how to use. So when it comes to like these things like sorting, um, maybe even ABL tree, uh, let's see what else, heap, uh, bitwise. You just kind of have to know the key concept behind, uh, you know, what these operators are or how the idea works for you to get points. You don't have to, you know, be amazing at it. But well, when it comes to bitwise, it comes a little further than just memorizing what it is that you have to do. Because a lot of the questions are more like uh, applied and they have like, I guess, some theory to it where you kind of have to know, okay, in this case, I want to take all the options that I can get, so I use or. In this case, I want to get things that are common, so I use an and. So let's just go through the different operators. So we know that you know binary exists, right? So we can convert eight into a number or kind of like a sequence in binary. So that would end up looking like this. 
So how does that end up coming about? We start from right and we go left. And you can kind of think of this value as the zero index. Think of this as the one index, the two index, and then the three index. But what are these index kind of representing? It's really powers of two. So two to the power of, two to the power of. And in this case, you can kind of think of this as a summation of two to the three, which is eight, plus two to the two times zero. So the, the way it kind of looks is one times two to the three plus zero times two to the two plus zero times two to the one uh, plus zero times two to the zero. And that just ends up giving you just eight. In the case you had like uh, this value right here, this is actually nine because now you just have a one times that value. So you have a one and we know that two to the zero is one. So eight plus one is just nine. So that's just kind of the idea of how it's represented. Uh, let me put this back. Okay, so now when we end up using some of the operators, so we have and, so this is an eight, this is an and, and there's also or, there's also XOR, and uh, oh yeah, there's right shift and there's left shift. So we have all these different types of operators that we can use. So let's talk first of what should be, I think the easiest one that you can think about. So there's right shift and then there's left shift. So really with left shift, what ends up happening is you're dividing a number by two, or, or sorry, with right shift, you're dividing a number by two. So you can think of it like this. You can think of every single binary sequence. Let's take this eight right here. So up until this index, we know that everything that we have so far, the, the rest is just gonna be you know, a bunch of zeros. But let's just say this is still eight. So this is the number eight. If I end up shifting it to the right by one, what ends up happening is we just kind of end up cutting a bit off. So when I say a bit, that just means one index. So let's just say we have this window. Okay, we want to cut one off. Now we're looking at this number. And we start from this and go leftwards. So now instead of this bit on being at two to the three, now it's actually at two to the two. And you know it's times one. So we can just think of it as, okay, we went from two to four because this is what this number is. So how, how does that end up happening? You just end up right shifting. So you can really think of a right shift and you can really calculate it easily by doing, so let's take any number. So a number just divided by two to the K, no, sorry, two to the K. So this is equivalent to, to right shift. So you can think of this as N shift K. So for example, if I give you, let's say 256 shift two, what's gonna happen is 256 divided by two to the two, which we know that, so 256, you know, you can do 256 divided by four, or another way to think about it is two to the eight over two to the two. And you can just subtract these out. So that gives you two to the six, which is 64. So we notice that the math ends up checking out. So you can just think of right shifting like this. Now, when it comes to doing a left shift, you can just think of it as doing this. So instead of left shift, instead of right shift where we're dividing, left shift is just multiplying by two to the K. So we can kind of say that N times two to the K is equal to N left shift K. So let's take the same example. So let's do 64 left shift two. Okay, so 64 times two to the two, 64 times four, so it checks out. Again, two to the six times two to the eight, you add the exponents, uh, two to the eight, and then that's 256. So the math ends up checking out. So this is really all that's going on when you're left and right shifting. You're just dividing the number by two. 
and it ends up checking out the numbers odd, right? So again, let's just do one last example. So this right here is seven, right? So this is one, this is two, this is four. You add these up, you get seven. If you shift this down by one, you end up getting three. So this is equal to three. Let's think about why that is. So, you know, we have a bunch of zeros all the way here onto the end. We have this number, which is seven. We cut this bit off. We don't think about it anymore. This is two to the zero, which is, you know, times one is one. Then two to the one times one, which is two, two plus one equals three. So it ends up checking out even with odd number. So that's the idea behind left shift and right shift. Now we have these three other operators. So let's take on and first. So and makes the most sense. So for those that have had discrete, you can kind of think of like, okay, true and false and uh, kind of like a set theory as well. So whenever you have like your truth tables and that sort of thing, or if you have, you know, so, some knowledge of how set theory works, whenever things are in common, that's when you want to kind of preserve values. It's the same kind of uh, idea of like intersection. But for those that haven't taken that class, you don't have to know it. It's very simple. So let's say we have a value. Let's say we have a um, seven, right? So this is one, one, one in binary. And let's say we have six. So this is one, one, zero in binary. And, uh, you know, there's also other zeros at the end and whatever. So if we take the and between these, we're just going to take, okay, where are these values? Where, where do they have ones in the same place? Wherever they have ones in the same place, let's preserve that one at that location. So if they have anything that's not the same value, we don't want it there. So what that means is, okay, if we have a zero and a one or a one and a zero, or, um, and we can even say like zero, zero, these are all equivalent to zero. The only case you're going to have a one is when you actually have a one and a one, this is going to give you a one. So if we want to take the and, what they have in common, what both of them have, we're going to see that, okay, this is a zero. One and zero are not the same. Uh, then we know that right here, that one and one, you know, they're the same. One and one are the same. And you can kind of argue that, you know, zero and zero also the same because they'll just end up giving you zero. So really, you just care about when things are in common. Like this has this and this has this, which is also part of that. So they both have the same exact things. Now, in the case of or, if we take the same example, which you can just think of it like it's greedy in the sense that it'll take whatever it can get. So in the same example, if we have seven and then we have six, if we take the or of these values, it's going to find anywhere where there's a one, I want it. So right here, you're going to say, okay, so we know again, I'll say I'll keep saying this so you don't forget, but there's a bunch of zeros to the left. All of these locations are going to be zeros. But when it comes to these ones, if there's at least one one, we're going to take it. So, okay, there's two ones. Let's take a one. There's two ones. Let's take a one. There's only one one. Okay, let's still take a one. So this ends up actually just being seven. Now, um, just to, to write it out. So if you have, uh, you know, one, 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 zero, zero, one, zero, zero. This is what you would end up with when you, if you do or. So this is for the or operation. One, 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 zero. So this is very, very easy. Take a one if you got it. Um, this one is more like, yeah. If they're both ones, give, give me it. If not, give me zero. So nothing. And now we can kind of think of XOR, which is the last one, where it's very, very similar to AND, but you can kind of say on the flip side. So the way I usually explain it is uh, just to go back to and real quick. And is kind of, okay, there's someone that usually agrees with you. Wherever you guys agree on, you guys want to kind of talk about that, right? 
But when it comes to XOR, it's actually the contrary. So let's say there's someone you want to, you always argue with. It's gonna, they're gonna take every chance or every location where you guys are not the same, and that's where they're gonna argue with you, right? So let's say the same example. So one one, one one zero. So again, seven six bunch of zeros. In this case, if you take XOR, we're gonna you're gonna see okay, we have zeros. Zero, like um, in, in this case, okay, you don't talk about this, you don't talk about this. Okay, we don't want to talk about it, right? Now, in this case, whenever you have a one and a one, you both agree. So let's say this person likes to argue with you, then they're not gonna want to talk about this because you both agree. So that's a zero, two. Same thing here. Now, when you end up having a one and a zero, you guys are opposites. You guys aren't on the same you know, page on whatever it is you're talking about. So this person wants to argue. So this is where they're going to take a one. Okay. So now you, you actually end up with this, uh, you know, binary representation, which is just equal to one. So just to recap, or wherever there's a one, you take it. And wherever there's a one and a one, you take that. Otherwise, it's all zeros. Um, wherever there is uh, something that's opposite between one number and another, that's when you're going to take a one. So again, one and one when you do XOR. And uh, let's do these cases. So this is a zero. This is a zero. But these are ones. So that's usually the explanation I give with these. Uh, most people... Uh, can you know get, understand them more like that uh, so yeah I hope that helped with those but now we kind of have to pull away from how it works and actually apply it so let's end up uh, so these we kind of ended up going through and it'll probably take a while to 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 do this one but let's just uh, let's just end up doing it a little let's do it quickly so we're gonna end up having So 56 or 17. Or actually, you know what? I'm, I'm not going to do this one. I'm going to do some coding ones because th these ones are very simple. I kind of went through this process already. So we're just going to end up skipping this one uh, since we kind of went through how it works. Let's, let's do this question. Let's do some of the coding ones. This is what people usually have trouble with. So in the game of Nim, there's several piles with stones, and two players are alternating, taking one or more stones from a single pile until there's no more stones left. So the person who takes the last stone wins. It turns out that if it's someone's turn, and if they play optimally, they can win as long as the bitwise XOR of all the number of stones in each pile is not equal to zero. So you have to write a function that takes in the array and you know the number of stone the piles and returns one if the current player can win otherwise zero okay so this question specifically uh, they kind of give away what you have to do in this line right here so pretty much they're, they're just telling you to write a function that ends up going through all of the piles and these piles are you know the the piles of stones and you have to take the bitwise XOR of all of these piles of stones together. And if that is equal, if that is not equal to, uh, so if it's not equal to zero, then in that case, the player wins. Otherwise, they don't win. So this one is probably, you know, not the best representation. We'll still go through uh, two other problems just to go through, uh, you know, the concepts better. But in this case, it's just as, as they ask you to uh, do it. So you start off with kind of, you know, can you win or can't can you win? You're trying to determine that. So let's just end up having a variable called answer. And we have to go through all of these piles of stones. So we can just end up setting like a for loop that goes through all the piles. And we just kind of have to XOR these in to any variable. And the thing with starting at zero, when you remember that XOR, it kind of starts off. Um, so if you start off with zero and you XOR values into zero, the first time you end up doing that, 
it just kind of takes that number because what ends up happening in zero, everything's a zero. So whenever you give it, you know, the, the first number, then it's just going to really become this number. Since wherever they're not on the same page, you know, you take a one. So really this is what ends up happening. And then from here, you might end up having other values where, you know, you're going to end up uh, comparing and seeing, you know, where can I take a one? Where can I not take a one? Uh, and so on. So that's just what, what's going to end up happening here. So what it's going to look like is you're going to do answer. And there's two ways of writing this, really. You can do answer, XOR, and this is going to be the piles at index X. So this is one way to do it. Another way to write this is doing this operator. So you, you can do it like this. This is another assignment operator. You don't have to, but this is two ways of doing it. And at the very end, after you've gone through all these, you just want to end up returning whether or not uh, the bitwise, like pretty much the, the result after you've done this operation on all these piles ends up equaling, not equal to zero. So answer does not equal zero. And this is really all you have to do. So again, I'm just going through uh, the question, but this is probably the worst possible example. Uh, let's end up going to another question. Okay, this is probably a good question to go on. Okay, so. Just write these. Okay, so you have 20 yes or no questions and you want to store in a sing and they're stored in a single integer, whether or not, you know, you've answered yes or no. So. It's saying that bit zero represents no, and a bit of one represents yes for that given question. So if one person's answer to questions one, three, and four were yes, then the, this would be the representation of integer, and the rest was zero. So this is, uh, remember this is index, uh, so this is index one, index two, three and four. So notice how this value is actually, this should actually be uh, shifting by zero and not actually shifting by uh, one. So you kind of have to account for that since they start at one and they don't start at zero. So consider the problem of finding the best match for a client out there. Uh, we consider match A for a client to be better if they share more answers on corresponding questions than the previous match. So let's say you have this case. So let's say you have, so you're the client, right? And let's say, let's just go again with seven. So let's say seven looks like this, right? And you have an array of different numbers. So again, this is seven. Let's say there's two possible people so let's say we have an array of two values. So let's say it's one, 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 zero, zero. And then there's someone else where these are their answers. Because remember, these bits that are on represents whether or not they've answered yes to whatever uh, question. So you said, okay, at this index, so, so let's say this is question one. So question one, question two, and three. You've answered yes, all other are no. On question uh, three, four, and five, this person has answered yes. And at question one and two, this person has answered yes. And then, you know, the other ones as well. So you kind of want to see who is the best match based on how many times we end up uh, matching on, you know, answers for questions and whether or not that's like, the best match. So what, what does that mean really? So if I have three in common, who, if I have only these three values answered, right? So let's just look, look at this window of values. Who do I have the most in common with? So this is where you kind of have to think about, okay, do I want to take how many ever ones I can get? Do I want to take how, how many ever um, things we have in common? Like what exactly do I care about? So in this case, 
you're trying to find the best match. So ideally, the best match is the person that has the most things similar to you. So right here, if we just look at this window right here, uh, because this is all we have, um, the client, this is seven. We only have one thing in common, right? So, so far, this is our best person, right? But then once we end up looking at the next person, we end up seeing that we have two things in common in terms of answers with this second person. So if we're comparing this client with this person and then this client with you know us against this other person, we know that person number two is technically a better match than uh, person number one. In that case, we're gonna wanna say, okay, the best match is person number two. So that's really kind of how we can end up thinking about uh, who has the best match. And really, the thing is, they end up giving us a function that we can end up using. So they define it down here. And all this does is count how many bits are on in a number. So remember, we care about what's common. So if we end up taking an operation. What operation do you guys think we need to use if we are looking for things that are common? You guys can just comment it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So and is what we're going to want to use. So let's take this one, for example, since we already kind of talked about it. Okay. And let's take this one right here. So we end up with these numbers. Now, if we want to actually know how much of a better match someone is, we got to count how many bits are on. And that's why they give us this, uh, this function. So they give us the count function. If we run it on this one, we get a one. And if we run it on this one, we get a two. So we got to first see what do we have in common and then count that and then update whether or not you know we have a better and better match based on how many things we have in common. So that's what we're going to end up doing with this question. So first things first, we're going to want to track, uh, you know, what the best number is in terms of how many things we match. So let's say max match count. Let's just say it's the maximum is zero. And then let's say max match number. Let's just say it also equals zero, for example. Okay, so now we're gonna wanna go through every single client or every single match that we have. Okay. And now we can kind of find out what do we have in common with the current client or the current match at index X. So we can say, uh, common questions. And all we have to do is take the client, which is us, and then matches of X. So right here, we have the number that represents how many things we have in common by doing the and operator. The next thing we have to do is take the count of that and see, is that count better than you know what we already have? So now we can do non common questions. We just say count of common questions. You know, you can end up putting all this in to one thing, but I'm just going to leave it like this. It's more readable. And now at this point, now that we found something or a better match, we can say if no common questions is greater than max match count, let's actually see what it is that we're supposed to return. Okay, we're supposed to actually return the index. Yeah, so we're returning the index of the array for the best match. So let's change this, not to the number, but the index. And actually end up removing this. So we're just going to go based off the index. And right here. can end up doing um, count of clients, or sorry, uh, matches of max match index. So we have an index that we're, that we're moving around throughout the array. And uh, if based on whatever index we have as the maximum, 
that we have in common with that person, if what we have right now is greater than what the previous max was, then we're gonna just update the max. So we can just say max match index equals X. So that's the current index that we're at. And at the very end, we can just end up returning max match index. So let's just go through it again. We're going through all the matches and taking the ands, seeing what questions we've answered the same with, counting the number of those questions that we answered the same with, or yet true with, or yes with, that we have in common with the other person, seeing if the number that we have in common at this current client or at this current match versus me is greater than what we previously had. If so, then take this as the maximum index and just return it then. Okay, so. Yeah, so <laughs> always, I remember always explaining this question. So they tried to do it a different way, but let's just think about it, how they did it real quick. So they ended up iterating through all of the matches, right? And they have a best and they have a res variable, et cetera. Our code still ends up working, but what they ended up doing is notice how they said there's 20 yes or no questions, right? So this right here actually means that it's between index zero and, or sorry, bids at index zero and the bid at index 19. Because whenever you do a power of two minus one, it's actually like you, you have a one all the way up until the, uh, like this index, so 20 minus one. So we have a one from bit zero all the way up to bit 19 in the number. So we actually have 20 slots where we can have a, you know, a one or a zero. So what they're saying is, okay, we have a total of 20 values. There are 20 like locations where we can have a match. Since XOR takes the differences instead of the things that are in common, what it's saying is, okay, so let's take the total number that we could have in common or not in common. So 20 minus what we don't have in common. So if you think about it, if you take the total number of things minus what you don't have in common, what are you left with? What you have in common, if that makes sense. So it's probably like in a different way of thinking about it. Like you probably didn't think about it this way, but it makes sense. So if we subtract the things that we don't have in common from the total number of things that we have, we're only left with what we're in, we, we're in com we're common with. Because you're either, you know, you have the same thing or you don't. It, it's only those two. It's either a one or it's a zero. So uh, that's kind of the idea of how he went with this. And you just end up updating whenever you find a better number, a better variable, then, you know, you take that index and return that number. So just a different way of thinking about it. You know, more complicated, sure, but they would give you full points for something like this. This is what most people end up doing. Okay. And I, I don't know why they put backtracking. This is not a backtracking question. That is kind of odd. Yeah, it, it is. Uh, we only have like 20 minutes left. So I'm actually going to pass it over to Eli. And uh, I, I can stay may, maybe another five, 10 minutes to do another question. And that's cool. So, All right. Go. go ahead and open something here for ABL trees really quick. All right, so AVL trees uh, are sort of complicated to understand, um, but we'll go ahead and try and make the rules as simple as possible. An AVL tree is a tree that balances itself so that every single node in the tree um, has a height in its left and right subtrees that differ by at most one. So let's let's take that really complicated definition and first figure out what we're trying to solve with an ABL tree. So a binary tree, um, like it, it can have uh, elements on the left or the right or neither or both. Um, maybe we have a tree that looks like this. This is a valid binary tree. This is a valid binary tree. No problem. In, uh, uh, in a case of a binary tree like this, let's say I wanted to search for one of the nodes that's at the very bottom. 
In this case, I would start from the roots. Uh, and if it were a binary search tree, which means that these are ordered such that everything on the left is smaller than everything on the right, um, then maybe like this is an eight, this is a three, this is a four, this is a nine, and this is a 12. If I wanted to search for 12, then I would look at the root here and say, oh, it's bigger, so I go to the right. Oh, it's bigger, I go to the right. Great, I found my 12. And on average, this will end up running uh, in log of n time, because again, our tree on average is going to be um, log of n in height. But the problem is that there are cases where it's not log of n in height, and rather, let's say we had a bunch of elements that we inserted in such a way. You gonna say something? All right, maybe not. But if I inserted elements in such a way that they devolved into basically a linked list where everything is in a line by constantly inserting things that are bigger, well, now if I wanted to find something in this list, the worst case runtime is O of n because we have to go through every single node in order to get to the bottom here. And if I wanted to insert something like a 19, again, in worst case, it would be all the way at the bottom. So a binary search tree is generally pretty good, but it does have really difficult worst case runtimes where it gets to O of n. We don't really want that. Uh, our tree generally, we wanna try and keep things log of n or constant time as much as possible. And so that's where an AVL tree comes in. An AVL tree guarantees that um, our height of our full tree is gonna be as close to log of n uh, as possible at all times. And the way we do this is every time we insert or delete, we may need to go ahead and rotate some things in the tree around. So if I um, put in one node here, and let's just call this eight, and this node down here is gonna be three, and this node is four. So let's say this is our tree right here. This is a valid binary search tree, but it has really bad runtime. So what we do is after we insert or delete something to our AVL tree, we need to check if all of our nodes are balanced. So let's say the node we're inserting here is this four at the bottom. We can calculate a balance factor for every single element in our tree. And it's the difference between the height of our left subtree and the height of our right subtree. So this leaf node has no subtrees. So left minus right is zero minus zero, which is equal to zero. Our three has a balance factor of zero minus one, which is equal to one. And then up here, our left subtree is of height two, and the right is of height zero. So this balance factor up here is gonna be two. And after we insert or delete from our AVL tree, if, our, if any balance factor is two, then we need to rebalance our tree. Every balance factor needs to be one or zero at most. So uh, in this case, we would need to rebalance this eight node up here. And the way we do that is by performing rotations. And that's where things start to get really complicated. So let's redraw the tree over here without our balance factors really quick. All right, so this is our tree here. So there's two different kinds of rotations we can do at every single level. We can do a single rotation or we can do a double rotation. In this case, what we would need to do is a double rotation. So uh, this is kind of where it gets complicated to explain. Um, but we want to rotate our tree at each element uh, where the balance factor is two, such that uh, we do it to, uh, we bring one node up, we bring all of its sub nodes up, and then we pull this one down to the other side. So in this case, yes, we're gonna do a left-right rotation. Left-right means that we need to do a left rotation and then a right rotation, so it's two, total for this node. And just a left rotation or a right rotation means that we only have to rotate one time. But in this case, we have to rotate twice. 
And here's why. So if I have my eight here, and I only rotated this once, what we would do in this case is we would bring our three up to the top, and then our eight would be pushed down a level. But because this four is a right child of this thing that got pulled up to the top, this now also has a right child. And so the four would have to be pushed. It essentially gets a free pass to be the leftmost element in the right subtree. So we, put, we just go ahead and magically fly it over to the other side. Well, this tree has the exact same problem as the other one, right? So this balance factor is still two up here, which means we can't just do a left rotation here. This is one rotation. We pull the three up, push the eight down, and we magically transfer the four. That's one rotation operation. In this case, what we'd have to do is we have to first do a left rotation on the child down here. So this child is three. We're going to do a left rotation, which means the three goes down and the four comes up. So that's our first part of the double rotation, the left part. And then our second step is that we have to do a right rotation now on the, on the one that had the balance factor problem in the first place, which means that the four comes up, the eight goes down. And then our three now can exist over here peacefully. We don't need to magically transfer it. And so now these two leaves have a balance factor of zero and the parent has a balance factor of zero as well because it has a height of one on each side, one minus one is zero. So that was a successful rotation. Our tree is now balanced, and this is a valid ABL tree. And we could go ahead and insert again. This is not like a heap where we have to insert down here. We could insert something right here. We can insert something right here. We can insert anywhere. And anytime we insert, we only want to balance um, all of the nodes that uh, are above this in the tree. So we would want to, if we inserted something down here, uh, this would be valid. If we inserted something down here, then we don't need to rebalance this three over here because nothing's changed. Maybe there's like a really complicated tree on this side. All of this is theoretically balanced already since we haven't altered it. And so we just go up to the top, um, starting from the parents of what, where we just inserted and we rebalance anything that needs to be uh, balanced. So we need to recalculate the balance factors and then perform our rotations. So we did a left-right rotation here uh, because we had this sort of like L shape. We could also do just a left rotation. Uh, if we inserted and our tree looked like this, our left rotation would just be to do this once. And now we would have our balance structure here. We can also do this the other way around. So if our tree looks like this instead, then we would have to do a left rotation rather than a right rotation. I may have misspoke up here, but this would just be a single left rotation. And again, if we had our sort of uh, elbow shaped tree here, we would need to do a right rotation on the child down here and then a left rotation on the parent. So uh, as you're inserting and deleting, um, we just want to make sure that we're balancing anything that's unbalanced from bottom to top. Uh, let's talk about deletion really fast. So let's say um, that this is what our tree looks like. This is a one. This is a five and this is a seven. Um, oh no, that doesn't work. So let's do this. This is a seven, this is a nine. So if we want to go ahead and delete a element here, let's say for simplicity, we're gonna delete this eight, which shouldn't be too hard. We'll look at some harder deletions, hopefully at the problem set. But uh, we need to go ahead and replace this. Again, we need to pick something to fill it, and then we need to go ahead and do our balance if we want to. In this case, we need to keep our um, left to right ordering property where everything to the left is smaller than everything, than the parents and everything to the right is bigger. 
So we can't just like pick any element to replace this. In a heap, we would go down to the bottom and pick the most recently inserted element. But uh, that you know, might not be the best fit here. So instead, what we can do is we can go into either subtree. If we go into the subtree of all numbers smaller, then we want to pick the biggest number from that. And if we go into the subtree where everything's bigger, we want to pick the smallest number. And in either case, we take that and we put it up here, and then we still have our correct ordering. So let's say that we went into the left subtree. We get the biggest number from this subtree, which is the seven. If I had something down here, like maybe this was uh, the eight that we deleted, for example, then our biggest number would be the furthest right element in this tree. So we would grab the eight instead. And we can go ahead and delete this node down here that we just moved up. So this is no longer connected. And let's calculate our balance factors. Um, so this one is zero, this one is one, this one is zero this one is one, and this one is zero. So this tree is now balanced, which is great. If we wanted to um, pretend maybe that this was unbalanced, um, then we could go ahead and do our rotations from here. In this case, uh, we would have different balance factors. So this balance factor up here would be one, this one would be two, um, or negative two rather. And this one would be negative one. Left is two, three, so this would be negative one. Left is zero, two, so this is negative two. And this is negative one, and this is zero. So the first one that has a problem is this negative two up here. We can solve this really easily by just a left rotation. Um, so this becomes four three, one, nine, seven, 10. All right, and that's the only rotation we need. Now all of our balance factors are good. Um, and there we go. AVL trees are a complete uh, pain in the ass. So don't, don't listen to that. As long as you can trace it out, that's all you need. Uh, and to be able to recognize the runtimes is important. Let's actually talk about the runtimes really quick. Um, the, the cool thing about uh, the ADL tree is that for insertions and deletions, it guarantees that our worst and our average case um, are going to be um, log of n. All of our cases are gonna be log of n, best, worst, and average. In, uh, in a balanced tree like this, um, because everything is like mostly filled, uh, there's no case where there's gonna be a really long string that we can skip and just insert right at the top here. And so our best case will always have to go to the, essentially the bottom level um, in order to insert. We may not have to do any balancing. The balancing is log of n because we only have to balance from where we insert all the way up to the top. Um, and our rotations are considered a constant operation. So going down to find where we wanna insert is log of n, um, best, worst, and average. Our insertion and our rotations are log of n. So the whole thing is log of n. And our deletion is the same thing. So all of our cases are log of n, which is pretty good because the comparison is that if we go back to our binary search tree, um, just our standard BST, uh, I think I must've deleted it in here. If we have a BST where we insert and it doesn't balance, then eventually we'll get to the point of where it's just a really long list of nodes. And in order to insert, we have to go all the way to the bottom, which is O of N. And in order to delete, we have to go all the way to the bottom, is, which is O of N. So log of N is a huge improvement for the really long lists, just requires some extra work to handle. Note that in this case, our best case insertion for a BST is actually O of one. If we just had a really long list and put it on the other side, doesn't matter how long the list is, we can always you know, have a best case where that happens. But like, this is really not worth considering. This will basically not happen. So having everything be O of N, or O of log of N rather, is better than that best case. Okay, let's try and do a problem or two really quick, maybe go like five minutes or over, and then uh, we'll leave a couple of questions at the end. So this is a problem. Um, that I had pulled up and we'll go ahead and do this one really quick. 
Um, cool. I'm going to put the Zoom chat down here. <clears throat> so we have an AVL tree, and we need to go ahead and insert it. Um, so let's draw out this tree really quick. This is 12, 39, 2, 12. This is 30. And if we want to insert 37, uh, it's in the text editor here. Oh, I didn't share my screen. You guys, uh, I'm an idiot. All right. So we're in Google Chrome here. So this is a problem we have pulled up. This is an AVL tree. It gives us the AVL tree and we're inserting 37 into it. Um, so if we wanna insert 37, we need to figure out where it needs to go. So this is a BST, which means it's less than 84, so we go to the left, greater than 25, so we go to the right, less, so we go to the left, greater, so we go to the right. So 37 gets inserted down here. So this is what our tree looks like. And now we need to go ahead and balance this. So let's calculate our balance factors here. So the balance factor of the root, the height on this side is one, two, three, four, and the height on the right is one, two. So this is a balance factor of two, which is bad. So balance factor is here. This is one, this is one, two, three. So this is negative two. Uh, and then 106, 0 minus 1 is negative 1. The negative 2 is bad. Our balance factor is here. Um, 12 has a balance factor of 0. Th 39 has a balance factor of 2. And 212 has a balance factor of 0. And down here, balance factor is 1. Down here, balance factor is equal to zero. So our first issue is with this 39 here. So we need to resolve this one first. And so our first rotation here has to be a left-right rotation, which Kenny already has in here. If we rotate this to the right, then our 37 has to magically get thrown over to the other side. And so now this just looks like this. And this would be our new thing. And this has the exact same balance factor problem. So we can't do that. We can't just do a left rotation here. Instead, what we need to do is we need to, um, sorry, we can't just do a right rotation. We need to do a left right. So we first go ahead and rotate the child. So 30 comes down, 37 can go up to the top. And now we can safely do a right rotation. 37 goes up, 39 goes down, and 30 comes up. All right, so we've done one rotation here. So now the balance factor here works. Um, we've gone ahead and solved this. So our new balance factor here is zero, which is great. Um, and our, the next one we have to solve is the parents. Um, this one actually has been fixed already. So our new balance factor is negative one, which is no problem. Um, so one minus two, and then 84 here, our balance factor is three minus two, which is one. So we only needed to do one rotation here in order to make this balanced, which is great. After you do a rotation, you gotta recalculate the balance factors. Um, if they're still wrong, if the parent is still off, then you can go ahead and do another rotation. There's some questions down here about big O runtime. Our best case for a new AVL tree insertion is log of n because we still have to go all the way down to the bottom, um, which is log of n in every single case because of how it's balanced. Uh, best case, we wouldn't have to do any rotation, but that's also log of n, so it all gets lumped together. Worst case is also going to be log of n. All of the cases are log of n, which is great. 
And just for a regular binary search tree, our best case insertion is again, if we have that really long linked list essentially where it just goes in one direction and then we insert on the other side. So our best case is constant time, but our worst case is where we have to insert on the end of that link, which is uh, O of n. So let's go ahead and check this, make sure our tree is correct here. Oh, go ahead and stop it. Cool. So this, <coughs> pardon me. So this tree looks correct. And down here, log of n, log of n, o of one, o of n. So that works. All right, it's nine o'clock. Uh, I will not hold anyone any longer. Um, we can stick around and do another ABL tree example if you guys would like. Otherwise, uh, we'll go ahead and see you guys next week. Have an awesome new year. Um, we'll be back same time, same place next Wednesday at 7 p.m. for a bunch of the mathy stuff. Yeah, for some of those bitwise questions, like the actual coding ones, there's some sessions that I did uh, both for Nighthex and then for Shep that I'm going to link real quick in case you guys wanted to cover or go over those. Yeah, lots and lots of great resources for all of these things. Any questions, throw them out now. You can unmute, you can type them, whatever. We'll stick around for maybe five minutes or so. All right, uh, so we got a question about the run times for the sorting algos, uh, so we can write them down. These, uh, would be a great thing to go ahead and Google um, and go through like an online tutorial to make sure that you understand why all those cases are. Um, I think tutorials point usually does stuff like this. Geeks for Geeks is really good. YouTube videos are really good. Um, I would focus less on memorizing everything rather than being able to reasonably think about it on the exam. I think that makes a lot more sense. Yeah, definitely understanding is best, but if you're short on time, which you guys aren't, uh, if you have to just memorize it, but definitely try to understand it before memorizing. Any other questions? Left shift. So right and left shifts are the double arrows here. To the left, to the right. Yeah, le left shift is a number times two to the k, and k is the number that you're shifting by. Yeah, but that's that's a right shift. When you're doing a right shift, you're actually dividing by two to the K. When you're doing a left shift, you're multiplying by two to the K. No worries. You can always drop them in the foundation exam section of the Discord as well. Yeah. We can patrol. All right then. I think, I think that's it for questions. All right. Awesome. Thanks for all the questions. Thanks for sticking around. And we'll see you guys later. Right, have a good see ya. Have a good new year. Bye.